Thank you all for your patience. Uh, Jean-Pierre uh, Lacroix, the Undersecretary General for Peace Operations, is uh, joining us. I believe he's in Lisbon. Um, so thank you, Jean-Pierre, for your patience. Thank you all for your patience. Happy Peacekeepers Day. Um, and I will turn it over to uh, the peacekeeping boss. Jean-Pierre, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Stefan, and good afternoon, everyone. Apologies for the uh, uh, questionable quality of the uh, visual, uh, but indeed, uh, as you uh, said, uh, Stefan, I am uh, in in Lisbon uh, in my hotel, and uh, but I hope you can see me and and hear me. Um, so again, thank you for joining, and uh, of course, uh, every year uh, commemorating the. Uh, uh, the peacekeepers who have given their life uh, in the service of peace is always uh, very moving. And uh, and I think this year in particular, uh, since um, we've had uh, 129 peacekeepers who lost their lives um, since the last uh, commemoration. And uh, of course, uh, what we want is primarily to pay tribute to them. And that is what the Secretary General has done. And, and to not only honor their memory, but uh, um, again, renew our condolences for, to their government and their loved ones. But uh, equally important, we want to recommit to uh, do more to not only uh, improve peacekeeping in general, but more specifically enhance or further uh, strive to better protect our peacekeepers, to improve the safety and security of our peacekeepers. I think uh, it's also um, clear that this year has been particularly tough on peacekeeping. Uh, in addition to the uh, usual, but already very hard, very tough challenges that our colleagues in the field are facing, um, and, 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 and this year has been uh, particularly uh, rich in intentions in, in events uh, such as uh, uh, the one that you, you, you are currently witnessing in, in Mali, uh, the, uh, uh, the eruption of uh, uh, Mont Nyaragongo in, uh, in Goma in the DRC, and, and of course, uh, just to mention the most recent event, but many other uh, very difficult moments that our peacekeepers have gone through over the last years. But in addition to that, as you know, they have and they had and they still have to deal with the impact of COVID-19. And here, I think they believe that they really deserve our uh, applause because um, one year ago, uh, we were not certain that peacekeeping missions could continue to operate um, because of the risk of the pandemic. And, and, and there were many efforts uh, made uh, collectively by our colleagues in the field here at HQ and uh, with a very collaborative work uh, with the various departments, Department of Operation of Support uh, uh, and many other colleagues from other departments, but, but also with our uh, member states and particularly our troop and police contributing country. As a result of that, our missions were able to continue the work to, to take all the needed measures to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the mission, but also to help communities. And, uh, and they continue to do this uh, as we are uh, currently uh, uh, rolling out a, a vaccine uh, in our mission. Our colleagues in the field also continue to support communities and host government in their uh, fight against uh, the, the pandemic. And I think it's also important to look ahead at uh, the uh, medium and long-term impact of COVID-19 that will uh, superimpose uh, themselves on uh, the already dire and difficult uh, situation. Now, the other thing that I wanted to, to, to say uh, as an introduction is uh, uh, the importance of the theme that we selected for this year, uh, the role of young people and how uh, peacekeeping uh, counts on, on young people, but also how peacekeeping operation and our colleagues in the field do their utmost to uh, empower young people in the countries in which they are deployed. Um, it's a particularly important theme and particularly relevant uh, because uh, in the end, peacekeeping is about preparing a better future, creating a condition for a better future. So it really targets young people and their future. But in addition to that, uh, most peacekeeping operations are deployed in countries where young people are the majority. 
And therefore, it is increasingly and extremely important to do whatever is possible to engage, empower young people in the communities. And this is what our colleagues are doing in the field together with other partners. And, and I strongly believe that uh, um, if we do not involve young people in our peace efforts, in protection of civilians, uh, in uh, building more resilient and, and credible and strong uh, uh, capacities, including state capacities, then uh, we're less likely to succeed. But then uh, the third reason is that uh, our peacekeeping operations themselves are young. Uh, young people constitute uh, a uh, predominant, uh, the majority actually, of our peacekeepers. Um, many, if not most, of our uniform personnel are young. Uh, we have a UN volunteer. There are many in our peacekeeping mission. They play a very important role. And we have other young civilian colleagues. And, and therefore, uh, peacekeeping operation is really about uh, uh, using, uh, the, making the best use of uh, the skills, the talents of our young colleagues. And I can tell you that uh, we really need their dedication. We need their energy. We need their innovative spirit, their innovative mindset, particularly at the time where peacekeeping needs to continue to evolve. And, and this takes me to uh, the continuation of our efforts under the umbrella of uh, action for peacekeeping. Um, we are now entering uh, what we call Action for Peacekeeping Plus, A4P Plus. Uh, it's the implement, it's a new implementation phase uh, for Action for Peacekeeping for the next two years. We thought it was important to take stock of what we had achieved, but also to uh, identify what, uh, where we should put more emphasis, what the key areas are where uh, we should redouble our efforts. And, uh, and we identified a number of systemic priorities, systemic issues on which we will uh, put even more efforts uh, collectively with our partners, with our colleagues in the field, uh, with our member states. It has to do with uh, how to um, improve the coherence and effectiveness of our political strategy with our colleagues, because uh, policy and, and politics is really at the center of, uh, of, of our efforts, um, uh, and, and we need uh, to be better and more coherent uh, in promoting and, and working on, on, on political solution. Um, how to work in a more integrated manner across the various components of the mission, but also with our partners in the field. How to be better at analyzing and, uh, and planning and, uh, and having a, a better situational awareness, which is so important for the protection of our colleagues and the protection of civilians. How to better communicate and also how to better counter misinformation and fake news, which are so dangerous to uh, the population and to our peacekeepers. How to increase and enhance our accountability to peacekeepers by in particular, making sure that there will be accountability for those who commit crimes against our peacekeepers, but also how to improve the accountability of peacekeepers by continuing our efforts on conduct and discipline. And finally, how to make sure that uh, we have the best possible relation with our host government, because uh, it's an essential relation that we need to have, and you know that sometimes uh, it can be challenging. Now. I want to highlight uh, two cross-cutting priorities that will continue to inspire and guide us moving forward. The first one is the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in peacekeeping. You have seen that uh, the Secretary General uh, uh, awarded uh, uh, a colleague, uniform colleague uh, uh, from Kenya, uh, Major Stepline Nayaboga, uh, with the Military Gender Advocate Award of this year. I want to congratulate her for her outstanding work in helping communities and in being a role model and in helping to advance the critical women, peace and security agenda in peacekeeping. And we want to continue to do this. And we also want to continue to increase the number of women in peacekeeping. We have more senior leaders in our uniform component who are women. Very soon, five head of police component in peacekeeping. The Secretary General, Secretary General just announced the appointment of uh, 
Major General Maureen O'Brien as the Deputy uh, Milad, uh, Deputy Head of the Office of Military Affairs, the first female serving in a leadership position, a general position in OMA, the first Deputy Milad, uh, a female officer serving as Deputy Milad. And, and we have uh, three general, three female generals serving as Force Commander or Deputy Force Commander. And we want to take this forward in addition to our efforts to continue increasing the proportion, the number of women in the police and the military, but also uh, in addition to our efforts to make the work environment of peacekeeping more welcoming to women and therefore to all those who serve in peacekeeping. And finally, the last thing I want to highlight is the incredibly importance of pursuing our efforts on safety and security of our peacekeepers. Um, I'm pleased to note that uh, this is a theme that uh, attracts uh, uh, increased attention from uh, our member states. I uh, was very happy to see that the Security Council um, adopted a resolution on that topic, Resolution 2518. Um, we have done a lot to uh, uh, improve the safety and security of our peacekeepers. We, we, we think we have registered uh, significant results in, in a number of areas. Uh, and over the last four years, there had been a significant decrease, particularly in the number of uh, fatalities in peacekeeper as a result of malicious acts. But you've also seen that since the end of last year, uh, there was a spike in those fatalities, particularly in Central African Republic and in Mali. Uh, the threat uh, against our peacekeepers from armed groups and the threat against our peacekeeper from uh, improvised explosive devices is are still is still very very high, and we constantly need to adapt because the threats against our peacekeepers and to the population we serve continue to evolve and continue to be more dangerous. So on safety and security of peacekeeper, I want to emphasize that we will continue our efforts with our troop and police contributing countries with our colleagues in the field and with our colleagues here at HQ. And I want to finish by uh, really thanking my colleagues here uh, at HQ, those who serve the great team of the Department of uh, Peace Operation, but also uh, colleagues in other department, Department of uh, Management, the Department of Operational Support, uh, my colleagues, the USG, Catherine Pollard, and uh, Atul Kare, uh, UNDSS, Gilles Michaud, and many other, and their team. And, uh, and I believe that uh, this uh, collaborative work is absolutely essential uh, to carry forward uh, our efforts uh, under the umbrella of the Secretary General's Initiative, Action for Peacekeeping. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Stefan. And um, of course, I'll be looking forward to your question. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. I know your time is limited, so we'll go straight to questions. Celia de la Varenne. Celia. Um, um, merci pour ce briefing. Celia, le on entend, on enlève le masque, plus Merci pour ce briefing. Euh, J'aimerais savoir, après ce second coup d'État au Mali, qui vient de survenir neuf mois après le premier, euh, pourquoi n'utilisez-vous pas le régime de sanctions qui permettrait éventuellement de cibler les individus, notamment ceux qui sont les auteurs de ce coup d'État Merci. Uh, shall I take uh, one or two more questions? Uh, uh, Stefan, I'm in your hands. No, may, uh, just uh, let's do it one by one. Maybe that. Vas-y. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I see there is French and English. Can I switch to French? I. Yes, that's fine. Would assume. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, je vais répondre en français. La question a été posée en français. D'abord, évidemment, nous sommes préoccupés par ce qui se passe uh, au Mali. Le secrétaire général a exprimé sa préoccupation. Euh, et le Conseil de sécurité aussi s'est exprimé. Ce qui est important, c'est euh, de remettre euh, la transition, la transition conduite par des civils euh, sur les rails. Euh, c'est euh, essentiel euh, parce que le Mali, avec ses partenaires, a besoin de se concentrer sur les défis fondamentaux qui affectent ce pays et la région, et, et notamment le défi euh, du danger terroriste alimenté par euh, l'activité des groupes armés et euh, les situations souvent désespérées des, des populations et des communautés. Euh, depuis le début de ces événements, nous avons travaillé, notre représentant spécial en particulier, euh, El Rasemouane, a travaillé avec euh, la CDAO euh, que nous soutenons, 
euh, avec d'autres partenaires, l'Union africaine. Vous savez qu'une mission euh, de la CDAO était jusqu'à hier euh, présente à Pamaco, à rencontrer les, les différents protagonistes. Euh, nous allons continuer à, à suivre de, de très près cette situation parce que, euh, encore une fois, les défis du Mali sont vraiment et très, très pressants euh, et nous avons besoin euh, des, transitions, des institutions de la transition qui fonctionnent, qui soient euh, euh, crédibles, euh, qui puissent conduire à la réalisation d'élections démocratiques. Nous avons besoin de travailler avec des partenaires, euh, pour, euh, des, des partenaires institutionnels au Mali pour continuer et renforcer nos efforts pour traiter les graves problèmes qui affectent ce pays. Je voudrais juste signaler que dans le, temps, le même temps où se produisent ces événements à Bamako et où se produisent également ces efforts diplomatiques en partenariat très étroit avec les organisations que je viens de citer, les partenaires bilatéraux également, nos soldats de la paix, sur le terrain, continue de travailler et continue d'être exposé à des graves risques, comme en témoigne aujourd'hui même l'attaque euh, à Haïti, euh, euh, qui a affecté, qui a euh, résulté euh, en quatre soldats de la paix blessés dans la région de Tombouctou à Berre. Donc, euh, vous le voyez, euh, il est important euh, de garder à l'esprit les défis très graves du Mali et donc la nécessité de résoudre très rapidement cette crise très préoccupante. Pardonnez-moi, mais vous n'avez pas répondu à ma question sur le régime des sanctions et sur son utilité, en tout cas de l'utiliser sur les protagonistes du coup d'État. Oui, j'ai noté qu'il y a un certain nombre de partenaires qui ont annoncé certaines mesures comme les États-Unis, d'autres pays qui ont mentionné euh, la, la possibilité pour eux de, de, ou la possibilité de telles sanctions. Je me souviens aussi que euh, l'été dernier, la CDAO en avait adopté, mais je crois qu'il est encore trop tôt pour déterminer quelle va être l'action, quelle va être l'action collective des partenaires. Mais ce qui est important, c'est l'objectif. L'objectif, encore une fois, c'est de remettre cette transition sur de bons rails et d'éviter euh, que l'instabilité institutionnelle au Mali affecte nos efforts collectifs pour traiter les problèmes urgents et sérieux de ce pays et de la région. Philippe Rater, EFT. Merci, bonjour Monsieur Lacroix, merci pour ce briefing. Euh, un, petit su, un petit suivi sur le, sur le Mali et le G5 Sahel, le bureau de soutien de l'ONU qui devait être créé et refusé par les états unis et le Royaume-Uni. Comment vous voyez la suite pour le G5 Sahel sans ce bureau de l'ONU Et ma deuxième question sur la Centrafrique, est-ce que vous pouvez confirmer qu'il n'y a plus de contact, plus de coopération entre la mission de l'ONU et euh, les troupes russes qui sont déployées dans ce pays. Cette coopération existait euh, notamment en début d'année, avait plutôt bien fonctionné au moment de l'offensive. Et là, apparemment, il n'y a plus du tout de contact, est -ce que, plus de, de coopération. Est-ce que vous pouvez le confirmer Merci. Alors, d'abord, en, en ce qui concerne le, le G5 Sahel, euh, vous le savez... Euh, nous, aux Nations Unies, le secrétaire général en premier lieu, euh, nous tous, nous soutenons activement les efforts du G5 Sahel et nous ne cessons de, de plaider avec beaucoup d'autres pays, avec euh, les pays du G5 Sahel d'abord eux-mêmes, mais aussi beaucoup d'autres pays, pour qu'il y ait un soutien renforcé au G5 Sahel. Et nous plaidons en particulier pour que euh, ce soutien puisse prendre éventuellement euh, la forme euh, d'un soutien à travers des contributions obligatoires, éventuellement un, un bureau de, de soutien. Bon, il n'y a pas encore d'accord euh, euh, des membres du Conseil de sécurité sur, euh, sur ce sujet, mais nous allons poursuivre nos efforts, nous allons poursuivre nos efforts d'explication, nous allons poursuivre nos efforts conjoints avec le, le G5 Sahel. Euh, dans le même temps, nous avons un dispositif euh, qui résulte d'un mandat du Conseil de sécurité qui fait que la MINUSMA, la mission, euh, fournit un, un soutien dans certains domaines, soutien vie, euh, les carburants, les rations, l'évacuation médicale, certains travaux d'ingénierie, fournit tous ces soutiens à euh, 
la force du G5 Sahel sur la base de financements volontaires fournis par l'Union européenne. Euh, ce mandat a été récemment euh, étendu euh, à la possibilité de euh, fournir euh, hors du territoire malien un tel soutien à travers euh, l'appui de la MINUSMA. Euh, nous faisons tous les efforts possibles pour le mettre en œuvre, mais il faut dire que tous ces mécanismes sont complexes euh, et ne sont pas à la hauteur des besoins du G5 Sahel. Euh, et donc, nous allons poursuivre nos efforts, encore une fois, pour, euh, pour euh, tenter d'atteindre cet objectif qui nous paraît important, d'autant plus important que les défis euh, dans la zone, les défis de sécurité euh, restent toujours extrêmement préoccupants. Alors, en ce qui concerne la République centrafricaine, euh, je crois que euh, quand on parle de coopération avec des forces bilatérales, euh, le mot euh, n'est pas le bon. Euh, ce qui était important et qui reste important d'ailleurs, c'est que lorsque plusieurs forces en uniforme se trouvent sur le même euh, terrain, euh, il est euh, essentiel d'avoir une certaine euh, concertation, une coordination, ne serait-ce que pour protéger nos propres euh, collègues sur le terrain, pour éviter qu'il y ait... Euh, des incidents entre différents éléments en uniforme. C'est ce que nous avons fait, c'est ce que le SAHG, mon cœur de euh, a, a, a cherché à faire. Euh, et en aucun cas, il ne s'agit de coopération, mais il s'agit simplement, je dirais, de déconfliction, en tout cas de, de faire le nécessaire pour qu'il n'y ait pas ce type d'incident. Maintenant, euh, la République centrafricaine, et pour aller un peu plus loin, d'abord, je pense qu'il est important de rappeler le rôle essentiel de la MINUSCA dans le maintien euh, des institutions, de l'ordre constitutionnel en République centrafricaine. Sans la MINUSCA, les élections présidentielles et législatives n'auraient vraisemblablement pas eu lieu. Euh, Aujourd'hui, la situation reste volatile, naturellement. Euh, ça résulte des activités des groupes armés qui se sont soulevées dans le cadre de la coalition qu'on appelle CPC. Et c'est évidemment très condamnable de leur part, euh, nous continuons de préconiser une approche qui, qui est fondée sur trois piliers. C'est à la fois la réponse sécuritaire à ceux qui prennent les armes, parce qu'il n'y a pas d'autre choix, euh, la réponse euh, inclusive, l'approche euh, du dialogue inclusif avec tous ceux qui rejettent euh, la violence et euh, l'importance qu'il n'y ait pas d'impunité pour tous ceux qui euh, commettent des crimes, des violations des droits de l'homme, quels qu'ils soient. Euh, et euh, simplement, je voudrais finir en, en ajoutant que nous continuons de travailler très étroitement avec nos partenaires, l'Union africaine en premier lieu, j'irai la semaine prochaine en République centrafricaine avec le commissaire euh, de l'Union africaine, euh, ambassadeur Bankolé, euh, et nous allons poursuivre nos efforts en soutien euh, au peuple centrafricain et au retour de la stabilité dans ce pays. Mais cette, cette concertation, ces contacts, comme vous les appelez, ils existent toujours actuellement entre la, la mission de l'ONU en Centrafrique et les forces bilatérales ou est-ce qu'ils ont été euh, rompus de, de quoi parlez-vous les, con, des... les contacts dont vous parlez, les contacts, la concertation avec les forces... Euh, alors moi, je, je vous ai parlé des forces russes, mais vous parlez des forces bilatérales. Euh, est-ce qu est -ce que ces contacts sont rompus ou est-ce qu'ils continuent Est-ce que cette concertation continue au jour d'aujourd'hui entre la force de casque bleu et, euh, et les troupes russes qui sont déployées dans ce pays je, je vais vous dire, euh, euh, il est toujours important euh, de veiller dans toute la mesure du possible, c'est notre responsabilité, à ce qu'il n'y ait pas d'incident sur le terrain, parce que nous devons protéger, nous avons une responsabilité majeure qui est d'assurer la protection, en toute la mesure du possible, de nos soldats de la paix. Et donc, cette déconfliction, si vous voulez, est absolument nécessaire avec les autres éléments en uniforme, qu'il s'agisse des forces armées centrafricaines ou de leurs partenaires bilatéraux. Ça n'est pas toujours facile, vous le savez, nous avons signalé qu'il y avait eu plusieurs cas préoccupants de difficultés, notamment rencontrés avec les forces armées centrafricaines et leurs partenaires. Nous avons signalé au Conseil de sécurité ces incidents. Nous allons continuer de plaider pour que cette, cela ne se reproduise plus. Mais encore une fois, je pense que nous devons à nos collègues sur le terrain de faire tous les efforts pour qu'il n'y ait pas d'incidents graves qui pourraient conduire à des blessés ou à des morts chez nos collègues, qu'ils soient militaires, policiers ou civils. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to um, we'll go to Iftikhar Ali first of Associated Press of Pakistan. 
and then to Toby of NHK Iftikhar. Uh, thank you, Steph. I hope I am not repeating anything because I couldn't follow the uh, conversation in French. But uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, Under Secretary General, here is my question. Uh, in your opening remarks, you did refer to the uh, safety and security aspect of the UN peacekeepers. Uh, uh, and I would like you to elaborate a little, little bit, because in the recent uh, Security Council debate, some specific proposals were made by member states about some kind of a special military, advanced military vehicle for the peacekeepers, etc. And also there was a suggestion that the peacekeepers should have some kind of a mediator or political role. Uh, would you comment on that, please? Thank you very much, and uh, you know, I'm glad to, to be speaking to you. Pakistan is a very important, uh, a trustworthy partner to, uh, to, to peacekeeping. Um, the, the, the safety and security of peacekeeper is uh, a paramount priority. We have a, an action plan. Uh, we work on several aspects. Uh, one of them is uh, better training. Uh, the other one is better equipment. Uh, we have uh, also made a lot of uh, progress in uh, uh, neutralizing uh, the uh, uh, improvised explosive devices before they, they hit our peacekeepers, and we, we've significantly increased the, the, the proportion of uh, neutralized IEDs. But we need to go further. Uh, and I was explaining that the, 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 as we are adapting to those threats, the threats themselves are uh, evolving and those who threaten us are adapting uh, the way in which they uh, go after us. Now, I'm very glad that uh, we've had, as I said, this resolution of the Security Council heightened interest uh, by members of the Security Council. As you uh, mentioned, I took part in a debate uh, with uh, uh, other colleagues on the, this very important topic, and, and indeed, there are a number of uh, areas which we believe uh, will have to will deserve uh, more uh, efforts, more focus moving forward. I think one of them is uh, the um, increasing our ability. I mentioned that earlier to uh, detect and preempt threats. Uh, uh, that is to say, uh, we need to have to better know the environment in which we operate. Our peacekeepers need to better know this environment. And this is why we pulled out uh, peacekeeping, what we call peacekeeping intelligence policy. Uh, and right now we're training people uh, to uh, implement this policy, but we're also asking our uh, troop and police contributing countries to provide us with adequate training, equipment, trained personnel, adequate technologies to help us in that regard. Uh, another thing is to improve uh, the equipment of our peacekeepers, and sometimes it's about uh, better protected vehicles, uh, so-called mine-protected vehicles. In, in some cases, it can be also about better use of uh, drones and uh, uh, UAS and, uh, and also uh, the, the people who can uh, you know, operate uh, these uh, devices. I believe that it is also very important to uh, deal with fake news and misinformation. Communication is essential. Misinformation and fake news uh, are a threat. Uh, they can kill uh, our peacekeepers. They can kill civilians. And we want to put special emphasis on dealing with uh, fake news and misinformation. Then again, it will require the right kind of technology and also the right kind of people, trained people to, to deal with these uh, challenges. Uh, so as you can see, I mean, there are a number of areas that we want to, uh, uh, to explore further. But when you talk about peacekeepers are mediate, as mediators, I, I, I see a very important point there. Uh, the more our peacekeepers engage with the communities, uh, the better they know what the threats can be and the better they build trust with those communities, which is essential to protecting those communities and also themselves. And here, the importance of having more women in peacekeeping, more women to engage with the communities is also critical. So you, you see that uh, there's a whole area, a, a whole array of issues uh, on which we want to put more emphasis moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll take, I know Mr. Lacroix is to go. We'll take a question from Toby, uh, NHK Japanese Television. Toby. Thank you. J'essaie de, uh, de poser ma question en français. Uh, pour revenir au Mali, 
Considérez-vous la situation comme un coup d'État dans le cadre d'un coup d'État euh, En ce qui concerne votre travail, euh, quelle est la différence entre cette fois et la dernière fois il y a neuf mois Merci. Is, do you mind if he answers in English? Yes. Uh, Jean-Pierre, si, if I could ask you to answer in English so we get some comments on Mali in English, that would be good. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, the, the question is, was, you know, if I may repeat, I mean, was, you know, whether, whether we consider these, uh, the latest event as a coup within the coup uh, and, and, and what uh, the difference is between now and, and, and a year ago. Well, uh, you know, I, first of all, uh, the, the, you know, I, I, um, I think, um, words, you know, may not matter so much as uh, the reality of what we're facing. What we are facing is uh, uh, a severe disruption of the uh, transitional mechanism, the transitional uh, institutions that were put in place after the coup last year with the joint efforts of uh, the region, the ECOWAS, together with the African Union, the UN, and many other partners. And this is very serious because this transition, uh, which was agreed uh, as a civilian-led transition with the uh, leaders from both the military and, and the civilian, but the civilian-led transition uh, is a critical uh, condition for the uh, preparation and holding of uh, um, free and fair and democratic election, which, uh, according to the, 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 the timetable that was uh, uh, published uh, recently before the coup in, in Mali, were to be held in, uh, I believe, February next year. Um, and, and, uh, and therefore, uh, even though, of course, uh, we, none of us really I mean, the, 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 like the coup uh, in July last year, the, 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 a solution had been found to put uh, the, uh, uh, the the, the, the uh, to, to put in place a political process leading to the restoration, a full restoration of constitutional order. And this is what is currently being disrupted, and this is why it is uh, very serious. And again, uh, this is a time of extreme challenges and danger for Mali and the region. Terrorist groups are still extremely active. Communities are being antagonized, manipulated in the center. There are uh, the, the, there is not even not, not enough uh, progress in the implementation of the peace agreement in the north, and and therefore uh, there is no time to lose. There is no time to waste, and uh, I am very concerned. We are concerned that uh, these recent events might further undermine, jeopardize. Uh, the joint efforts that we absolutely need to make uh, to address those key challenges in, in Mali. So again, it is of critical importance to uh, find quickly a solution, a solution that will be consistent with the principles that have guided the efforts of uh, uh, the, uh, the partners of Mali so far, and, and, uh, and the solution that will enable uh, the country and its partner to focus on these real, uh, very challenging threats that the country and the region is facing. Jean-Pierre, uh, obrigado, thank you. Um, and I know you have to go, so we will uh, release you. Uh, and we'll now start our regular briefing. So thank you again, Jean-Pierre, for joining us for International Peacekeepers Day.